Hello, how y'all doing today? My name is Bernie Thompson and today we're here to take a look at this 2003 Ford Thunderbird. Now this little Thunderbird, he's sick. He has no way to fly because once you give it throttle, it won't go. The throttle response just goes away. So the drive-by-wire system is failing on this car. So we need to figure out why that drive-by-wire system is failing. So the first thing I want to do is take a scan tool and get some basic data off of this T-Bird. So let's go ahead and get that scan tool connected. Okay guys, I got the scan tool up. Let's look at the data. So right away I have good fuel control. I'm switching and I'm centered. The long-term trim is good. The total trim is good. Bank-to-bank -bank trim is good. Um, I'm still warming up 185 degrees on the engine. The engine vacuum is good, about 15.3 vacuum. I expect 15, 16, I'm a mile high. I'm 5,500 feet, so that's about normal. Charging voltage is good, 14, so I'm charging. We have two codes, and they've cleared the monitors, and we know they've been working on the car, so they've just cleared these codes, so the monitors have not rerun. Let's look at the codes. Okay, so we got a throttle actuator code and it says it's a processor fault. So that's a really interesting one. And we got a throttle actuator code, forced idle. So when you see forced idle, is what that means is that the idle could no longer be controlled for some reason. In other words, if the throttle plate got stuck, if it's carboned up and it got stuck, the motor couldn't move it. So it would start to shut off cylinders and that would give you a misfire. And one of the customer's complaints is the car is missing and runs bad and it doesn't have throttle response. Well, the misfires are just trying to control the, the idle. If it can't control the idle, the last step it will take is to shut down injectors and shut those, those cylinders down from firing and that will load the engine to where it will slow the engine down so it can control that idle speed. Now the one that's interesting is this throttle code right here. Now that says it's a module fault. Now on all drive-by-wire cars, all of them have two micros in them. One micro is for a watchdog, it's referred to as a watchdog, and the other is a control. So they all get the same data, so they take the sensor data, all of them get the exact same data, both micros, but they run something that's called dual path software. In dual path software, that means that I have the same data, but I'm running two different algorithms and they have to come up with the same control scheme. If they come up with a different control scheme, the throttle goes into a default mode, and then I shut Eiffel. So that makes me think that either something's not right with the microprocessor or the microprocessor's getting confused for some reason. But for some reason, those two micros are not matching each other. The data is different. Anytime you see the two micros, the watchdog and the control unit, they always have to match the data. This is a safety critical system. And usually these codes for these systems are pretty good. But I've learned a long time ago, I don't believe codes. I believe the data. So we're gonna need to go back and we're gonna need to get into this throttle body. But before we do that, I wanna go and I wanna get some basic data. So I'm gonna go to total trim and I wanna load these charts here. So now we're going to drive this guy and we want to just sort of drive normally but accelerate all the way up. Okay guys, we have a pretty good fuel trim problem up high. You can see that we got it when I got wide open. Let's go back up through here again and just see what we get. go down here at the stop sign and let me take a look at this data but I can already see that it's broken it's red so we've got we've got something wrong with the fuel control okay do you see how we're green down here at idle and then as we come up we got orange and then it goes red now we're going from minus one two percent and we're going to almost thirty percent 
and it gets worse you notice how it's got yellow which is a slight problem and then it's orange it's broken and then it's really broken red and both banks are the same so that's like as I load it I've got more trim this, what's wrong there I need to come over here and I need to run a VE test So now we can figure this out because this will give me my air rate. So all we got to do is pull first gear and then let's just take a look at this data real quick so we can see it. So we can see that the, the actual air rate is in yellow and the red is our model. We built a model in this and we can see that scaled so we know what we're doing here on this engine. We can see how they directly followed each other and we're all green. So the air is being read correctly but the fuel trim is way off so this has some type of a fuel delivery problem almost the way this looks maybe the filters partially plugged now guys do not get confused this is not what we're looking for this car loses throttle control and it misses now the lean isn't at the bottom where we're having an idle or a quality problem of controlling the idle and it defaults so that's not what we're looking for remember what we're looking for don't get distracted keep your eye on the ball we have a throttle control issue that means what I want to do now is I'm not worried about this fuel trim the fuel of this fuel trim is not what's going to cause my problem now the shops going to need to deal with this so you need to know it up front like we do now but I need to figure out why this is setting module codes for the throttle control system and that's something other than than this so let's go back and get a scope connected to the throttle body and see what data it provides so we can figure out how to fix this car. Okay, so I've got the scope connected. Let me show you what I've got connected. This is the motor control over on this side. So I've got the channel 6 and channel 5 that's purple and white on the control circuit and I've got an amp clamp which is going to be really important for this code because if the throttle starts to stick the amperage will go up and that I want to see that so that'll get me there over here I'm going to have a 5 volt reference a ground and I'm going to have two signals that are different they'll never be the same because this is a safety critical system and then I have one more lead so I took channel 8 and this is an ignition pickup this is an antenna and so it'll pick up the coils now let me show you all the coils and the plugs have been replaced on this engine twice this this has a TSB for that throttle control has a TSB on it saying that it's a known problem that if the coils or the spark plugs have a too high an output that the computer will throw that code so this is here from another shop that's been trying to fix this car for some time and they put a lot of parts on it including TSBs but always a better idea than just putting a part on because the TSB says it's that way is to test it take your scope and on this car you can hook up this has a primary connection that goes directly to the computer so this is an easy an easy coil set to scope guys scope them and see if they have too much draw now I don't have enough leads because I've used all my leads on the throttle so I just want to see if I've got some kind of real high draw off of a coil so I'm going to use this and this is going to be an ignition pickup and this is going to work really well for seeing if we got high coil draw but before you just do a TSB and throw coils and plugs and everything else test it you'll be way ahead because they've put a bunch of parts on this car and it's still not fixed so maybe we need to start diagnosing it and try to figure out what's really causing this rather than just putting parts on it because there's a TSB TSBs are valid but you got to test what they're saying not just do it you got to see if that's your problem or not not all TSBs have to do with the car that you're in question now I really understand why they're worried about the coils because Ford directly 
power grounds these coils in the computer. Now a lot of cars got away from doing that because if I have really high flyback voltages off of the coil, then I'm hooked to the primary and that primary can have 500 volts and it goes into the computer and hits the computer, it can set gates out. And that can give you all kinds of drivability problems. Now this is an older car, but a lot of companies like Ford a lot of times will still control the coils directly. But a lot of car companies got away from directly controlling these coils inside the micro. Now they send a 5 volt trigger out to the coil and the module is in the coil. And the reason for that is obvious because now I don't have all that high energy going into very sensitive IC control units in the microprocessor. Okay, and then I got the ground and the battery is in the trunk, so I've got the battery on the negative, the, the scope ground is on the negative post of the battery. That's the only place that you can put your ground when you first start working on a car, because I have no idea if I got a ground path problem or not. But if I'm on the battery ground, I know that that's okay. So I've got my ground going to the trunk. Now let's go ahead and see this. So we're connected and everybody's connected. So now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and start this. We want to go ahead and start the car up. And so right here we can see that we have 5 volts. And let me, let me explain a couple of things here. So this is my ground and I got a good ground and I got good 5 volts. These are my two signals. So if I take these two signals and I add these together, I'll always have 5 volts. That's the way the microprocessor is done. This is the way the programmers are going to do this. So if I get the cursors, and we cursor through each one of these, okay, so we have 4.6 and 1.05. So if you add those together, that's a little over 5 volts. So whatever I add together, these should be 5 volts. So I want to do something else real quick. I want to open the throttle up and I want to show you a trick because you really need to understand how the micro is done. Now the other thing is, is always remember that if you're having a default, if you're having a default on the throttle, if the car's not running but the key is on, that throttle will become a follower. That means that what you do with the accelerator pedal position sensor, this will just follow it. Now once it starts, if something's wrong with it, it'll default and it won't move this. But if you want to see if this will move, shut the key off, kill the car, turn the key back on, and now it will follow it. They'll follow it because the motor isn't running so it can't run away. So one good trick when you have problems like this, now what I wanted to do here is I want to show you something. Right here where these two cross is 2.5 volts. 2.5 and 2.5 volts is 5 volts. In order for the processor to see if these sensors are failing, you got to program it. So the way they're going to program this is you're going to always add these two channels together when you have this type of a system. That means where they're crossing over. One starts high at about 4 or 5 and one starts at about 0.5 and you add those together, it's 5. When they cross over, both of them cross at 2.5, 2.5 and 2.5 is 5. Well, wherever I add these together, I should get five. So it's a real simple processor that doesn't use up a lot of computer power. If all I'm doing is looking at those two voltages and adding them together, and then I say it should be five volts plus or minus a percent, and if it goes outside that percent, that's my target that I set a code where the throttle position sensors, I could code them. So it's always a good way to understand how this works. Now the APPS signal will have a different type of signal. One will be low and one will be higher and they'll both come up. They're not crossing. Now on some systems they cross, but on most of the cars 
There are two signals and they both rise and they don't cross. But on some cars, the APPS signal does cross, but on most of them it doesn't. But this is a really common throttle body system to where I cross and I add the two together and wherever they are, if I add those together at that point, I'll always add up to five. And if I don't, then it'll set a code. Usually your percentage is 13%. So if it's great if it's it's greater or under than five volts by 13%, I'm going to set a code for that. So that's one way I've always used, and this works great. So now is what I want to do is we want to go ahead and we want to run the run the program. Let me start the car up and let's see if we can get this thing to die because we need to watch this data while it dies so we can understand what's causing the car and it doesn't die it defaults I misspoke so we're waiting for the throttle to default so you see how these got hashy when I started the car and there's like noise on them that's normal guys so this is normal this is the motor controls. Let me show you. Do you see how every time I turn the motor control on, I've got some drops here? Well, that's going to give me noise from the motor control. And the motor control frequency is usually about 10,000 times a second. On newer cars, it'll be 20,000 times a second because it moves it above our audible hearing. The acoustic noise doesn't, people don't complain. You guys know when you put the key on and you hear the throttle body and it buzzes, that real high-pitched buzz? Customers complained about that and that goes back for warranty. So to fix the noise, they just went to a higher frequency that's above our audible hearing. And now the sonic energy doesn't bother the driver. So, older systems usually are about 10K and newer systems are usually about 20K. The 20K was added, that has nothing to do with the control. That strictly, it doesn't make a control better. 10K works great for control, but it makes noise. So the OEs, most of the OEs went to 20K, so it's above our acoustic hearing. So here's my amperage. Let's go ahead and shut this off so we can see our amperage. See how each one of these is our peak and amperage and control? And so let's go cursor. So basically, we're pulling about two amps right there to keep the throttle closed. So let's do something else. I want to snap the throttle. I want to snap the throttle. Okay, do you see how the current reversed? Let's watch the control. See how the control changed? This is an H bridge. So Basically, this is closing the throttle and this is opening the throttle. So when I revved it, this gave me opening. Notice how the current reversed. So the orange is the current. Do you see how the current's coming up? The current's moving up and then the current reverses to go to move the throttle the opposite direction. See, this is where it's reversing. This is trying to open the throttle. And we can see that roughly, we again, we have a couple of amps either way. This system actually pulls less current than a lot of these I look at. So this isn't pulling that much amps, just a couple of amps each way. To open it's a couple amps, to close it's a couple amps. Some of these systems are more like 7 amps. So this is just a lower one.
very interesting. So again, you can see the current going this way. That's to close the throttle, and this is to open the throttle. Now when the system defaults, that will stop applying and is what happens is the default spring in here will pop the throttle open and this engine's going to run at about 18 to 2,000 RPM. And then so they can control the idle so a customer might be able to drive the car and get it into gear, they're going to shut cylinders off and on Ford they usually shut the two inside cylinders on, bank, on this bank and the two outside cylinders on that bank. And then we can also look at something else that I've got going here. And that's the antenna. So I just wanted to see the antenna just because... Because this is a known problem on these cars. So you can see this is where I had my dwell time, this is my fire, this is my burn line, and this is the energy that's being reabsorbed. So we could go through and we could look at some of these coils fire. We can see we revved it, so we have hash here. Again, this is my dwell time, my burn time, and the coil reabsorbing the energy. So if we had something go way wrong, I have an idea by just having my antenna, and I can look at multiple cylinders with that antenna at once. But it works pretty good for what I'm using it for here. So we're going to shut all these back on. We'll go back out. And again, this is where it's controlling it to close the throttle plate. And this is where it's opening. When we default, this control is going to go away. And that's what we're waiting for. So let's go ahead and watch this. And what i got to do now is I need this car to default. Now they tell me that the car just defaults. I just let it idle and it will fail all on its own. You see how we got power and it's being turned on? And when it turns on, you can see the orange current coming up. Well, that's the current that's closing the plate. And every time this turns on, and these are gonna get wider, and that's gonna open the plate or close the plate with more current, more force. So once again, what I need to do now is I need this thing to just fail. So we got the data, and we sort of got an idea of what's going on. So now let's just watch the scope and hopefully this car participates with me and it'll actually stall. Okay, we're just sitting here and the car's running and we're waiting for the throttle to default, but we've been here for quite a while and it's not done anything. Now when the shop gave me this car, they said that this does this all the time, but I don't see that, it's just not doing that. So what I think I need to do is I need to go and talk to the, the owner to figure out what, what causes this vehicle to stall. Okay, so I went and I talked to the owner and they're telling me that this car dies all the time and the lady is complaining that when she goes to Starbucks and she's pulling up to get her coffee in the morning that it's stalling in line and it also stalls when she's just driving and she stops. Now it's winter here and so what I'm pretty sure is the air conditioning or the heating system is on to heat it and the defroster is on to defrost the window. So what I want to do is I want to put the defroster on with the heater and I want to see if I can get this car to stall now. Okay, so we have the heater control and auto, and that's going to bring up the defroster. And I have no idea what it's going to take to make this default, but at least I know now this is in the morning when she leaves work, and it's, it's 18 degrees here in the morning. So she's probably got the heater and the air conditioning defroster on, and maybe that's adding to the problem of this. We just need to see if it's going to stall, or not stall, but if it's going to default or not. The throttle defaults. 
and then she loses throttle control and she has to restart the car to get the throttle control back. There it is. Okay guys, we got it, finally. Okay, so we can see where we're controlling the throttle and then it defaulted. And we can hear the engine and the engine is now misfiring. I can hear it. So it's trying to control the, the idle. So let's go ahead and we want to zoom in here. Want to try to see what happened here. So this is the control and this is the control to close the throttle. Now what I'm really interested in right away is just to look to see if I have any heavy current. So the orange is my current. Let's turn off the antenna. So this is the current right here in orange. We'll amplify it. So the current all looks pretty stable. I don't see anything there. So now is what I want to do is we want to look at the signals. Let's turn this guy off. Let's go back out. Okay, now right here I had a little shift in my sensor. So that's a sensor movement right there. Let's see where that happened. So that just happened when I stopped controlling the plate open because now I'm not forcing it closed. So that's normal. So I would expect that. As soon as the current's not there, we'll see the current's pulling it closed. We stop closing it so the plate opened. So that's not any, we defaulted before that move. So what I'm interested in doing, take a cursor right here shut this off. Okay, so I'm looking for some type of heavy noise over here or something where this and this won't be the same signal or could be interpreted by the two micros differently. Like I got so much noise that one micro sees something other than the other micro. Okay, so those look okay. And basically I've got 800 millivolts and 4.2, that adds up to 5 volts. So the 2 added up to 5 volts, I don't see anything that would cause one micro to do something other than the micro right there. So we've looked at the data right here, and we can see our 5 volt is here, our ground is here, our signals are here, the control is here, the current is okay. Here's my signals. We can see that we defaulted right here. I want to go ahead and I want to shut some of this other data off right now. And I want to go ahead and we want to look at the uh, at the ignition. See if we see anything heavy with the ignition that occurred. Okay, I really don't see any big hits off this ignition. Go back out, we can sort of see you do it this way. Nothing really stands out to me that I had some excessive draw ignition or KV hit to where the KV went way up and it would have spiked that computer. So I really don't see a high KV or a high discharge created by the coils. We can see from over here and come across there's really no high really high V spike. Everything looks okay on this so I don't see a problem. So now we've got to ask ourselves what's the change? This car I've been here for almost two hours and it did not die until I turned on the air conditioning. 
and really that's the heating system but the defroster is on which makes the air conditioning come on under defrost and I can hear the clutch go in and out on this motor so I know the clutch is cycling so I got to think about what would cause my problem so the first thing I'm thinking is the clutch diode isn't there and so I have a heavy spike from the clutch the other thing that I can think of is when the air conditioning is running, I'm making pressure. And if I'm making pressure, the pressure transducers can short the 5 volt and that might make this happen. So those are really my thoughts. Now some of you might think, oh yeah, the air conditioner on, it's loading the motor and that's what's making it. No guys, I don't think that's going to cause this problem. This is some kind of electrical noise. So for that to happen, we have something else going on. Now maybe even the blower fan, sometimes blower fans can have feedback out of those that will give you noise. Now I don't really see any noise on here, so I'm not sure, but I don't really see anything that's going to cause this issue that I've captured. So now is what I want to do. The first thing I want to do is the easiest one and that's going to be the air conditioning diode. We can get to the relay and we can get into the relay and we can see if that has a flyback on it or not. So let's try that first. Okay guys, I checked with the wiring diagrams and I found the AC relay and it's this one right here. Now what I want to do is I want to pull that relay up and I want to put some little tiny wire in there. This is the wire that I'm going to use. It's an odd 30. So this is, this is six thousandths wire. And this is great for doing this kind of work because I'm not going to disrupt anything but I'll be able to get the reading off of that relay because that compressor is buried under the car. So I want to do this the easiest way. So these are the two leads that I'm interested in. So I'm going to just slip a wire into each one of these. It's not cooperating here. So we're going to just slip these wires into the positions and then I'm going to just stick that relay and this wire is so thin it won't hold the relay up. So it'll work really, really well for us. Okay, so there we go. We've got our wires. Now, I want to take my scope and I'm going to hook my scope up to these leads. Now, I'll be able to watch the flyback when that relay opens or closes if I have any. Okay, so let's go ahead and get the scope started. Now let's go ahead and start this vehicle up and see if we can get it to stall again. Hopefully it cooperates with us. Oh wow, look at that guys. Okay, so we got this thing running now. Okay, look at that. That's the flyback. Let's shut these channels off. And it didn't default, but look at that spike that came down. So when I turned off the clutch, let's go ahead and get this in fast capture. 
Okay, I just heard the compressor. Let's check it. Here, look at that spike right there, guys. This is so cool, I cannot believe this. Do you see that spike? Well, that's coming from the air conditioning. That's the lead that we have on the relay. Okay, every time that thing spikes, it's smacking that computer. Guys, that's what's making this, this T-Bird lose its throttle. So let's get this thing to stall again. I can see what's happening. The clutch, when the air conditioning clutch is turning off, it's got a huge flyback or flyback voltage and that voltage is going into the computer system and it's kicking the gates. That's what's setting these codes. It doesn't have anything to do, like the TSB says, with the ignition. It has to do with a spike all right, like the ignition would make, but this doesn't have anything to do with the ignition. This has to do with turning on and off the air conditioning clutch. Okay guys, I've got 20 seconds. I've increased to 20 seconds. We're in fast capture to make sure we can get a good look at that spike. There it is. Here's the spike right here. Here we hit it and here we defaulted. So we spiked and we defaulted. So we can clearly see that that compressor clutch is causing our problem. It's hitting it and it may not hit it and, and get it to stop immediately, but it do, if it hits it, and then it dislodges the gates in the computer and it doesn't know what's going on, then we get this default on the system. The AC compressor being turned on and off with the electrical clutch is what's causing the problem. There it is. Okay guys, here's the spike right here from the clutch. And here I spiked and then I shut it off. That's just so cool, I can't believe it. This is the clutch opening up and bam! And as soon as we hit it, the computer, the computer gates get off and then we get the system to default. Here's the spike when we sh when the car when we restarted when we shut the car off and then we waited to restart it. Look at how big that spike is. It's a huge spike. Now this one isn't as big, but it's big enough to hit the computer and dislodge the gates. So this guy is hitting and then right away we can see that we that we have a default error. The, the throttle body defaults and it shuts off, it stops all control of the system and that's just because the gates are got knocked out and the watchdog, the two micros don't agree because it got hit by that spike. Every time we hit it with that spike it's just knocking the dog out of that computer and so that's what's going on. So this is the stock relay, I've taken it out and I've put in the switch so now I can turn the clutch on and off without having the computer do it for me. Okay so now I want to toggle my my relay and this is activating the AC clutch and as we can see now we can see the drop down that it's got there. So to get a better idea of what that drop is Okay, so that's uh, 165 volts on that drop. So this is the flyback voltage or the, the magnetic intensity collapsing around the winding. So I want to get rid of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a diode in.
put a diode in it, we're going to try this again and then we'll see what we get. And so we've got the wires coming out right here and then I've got the black wire comes over and that's on my negative and that's what's connected right here and then we've got this going back and we're connected right to the ground so I'm, I'm taking this lead right here and when I've got it like that we got a big kick so if I've got this connected to the battery ground right there we get rid of the kick when I put it right here now we've got the inductive kick because the diode doesn't have a ground path so I'm moving it over here to the battery ground and that's giving me a path for that diode to have that current circulate so again here's the diode right here and notice the band on the diode is facing the power supply so the current can't just go through and short but what it's going to allow is for that current to loop around so that's the system we've got and this switch just makes it really nice to make sure that I fix the flyback or I didn't fix the flyback because now I can turn it on and off and I don't have to have the processor do that for me so that's the setup we've got guys okay guys I got the rocker switch in here so I'm going to kick it on all we're doing is activating the clutch and we can see that we have this large uh, flyback voltage and that flyback voltage is 170 volts so it's 171 volts on that flyback voltage now is what I want to do is okay so we're going to kick this a couple of times now I'm going to put the diode in. I'm going to move the ground to the diode so the diode will work. And let's try it again. So now we can see that we lost that tail. The diode is taking, is eating that uh, inductive kick out. Now I've got the diode out again. We can see the kick. I'm going to put the diode in. So now we can see that we don't have that kick. So when we're turning it off, the kick isn't going down anymore. So we're not, we don't have a kick. So this is the way you would fix some kind of an inductive kick off of an inductor. And that's a coil wrap. So an inductor is a coil wrap and it's got a big magnetic field around it. And when you shut it off, that magnetic field collapses. So we need it to have another path so it can loop around and it doesn't create that big kick so now we've got that diode in we can start this and run it and then see if we're going to get a default or not I'm going to go ahead and put the factory relay back in now and then we're going to run it and see if this car is going to still die or not Okay, so we got the car running. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to turn off. What I'm interested in seeing is the red. Shut these off, let this run. I want to watch the red and the yellow. The compressor clutch is on right now. We'll see when it releases if we get a spike. We shouldn't because the diode is in. And we're just seeing, we're running the car right now to see if we're going to have a default of this throttle body or not. I go turn the air conditioner off. I need to make sure that. Okay, that's good. We turned it off. 
There's no spike right here. We can see that the AC went off. Go ahead and turn it on. Okay, we don't have a spike off the bottom. We can see that. See, there's no spike. The diode is now taking care of that. So now we're going to just let it run with the air conditioning on. And we're going to let it cycle and we're going to see if we get a default or not. But the diode is definitely suppressing that spike. And that's exactly what it's intended to do, is a spike suppression. It's that inductor, which is the air conditioning clutch, is making a huge magnetic field. We're just trying to correct that magnetic field. Now that's it turning off, and again, you can see that we don't have a spike down underneath it. There's no spike down here. See, it just comes down. So we've eliminated the spike. Now we're going to see if it's turning on and off. Now the clutch turned on, we powered it. And when we done power, it's when the spike will come down, but we have a spike suppression diode in, so it's not going to spike down. What we're waiting to see is if this system's going to default or not. Okay guys, I brought up a wiring diagram for the air conditioning compressor clutch and relay. Here's the relay, right here, and we can see that right across the relay, there is no spike suppression diode or a spike suppression resistor. We can see that this green wire comes out, the power comes down from the fuse, the power comes down from the fuse here into the relay and goes out to power that clutch. Here's the clutch right here. We can see that there's no spike suppression diode across that clutch, nor a resistor. So basically what I did is I put a, a diode right off of this wire to ground. This goes to ground. What that diode right there does is it allows when the magnetic field is built up around this winding and it starts to fall, it allows a real slow path. It'll just start to circle around and around and around and it stops that magnetic field from moving so fast across that winding and making a spike, so it suppresses that spike. So I put the, my diode from right in here, and that fixed the, the, now what I find very interesting is in this diagram I have no spike suppression on this at all. But let me assure you guys that any engineer knows that this field coil carries quite a bit of current and has a lot of windings because that's how they're made so they can pull that clutch in. So when you release these they get a big spike. Now without having any kind of a suppression unit here that spike is going to hit the computer system and it's going to create problems. If the spikes are big enough, I've seen these these systems where if they go a long time it'll actually damage microprocessors. So what happens is is this is going to need a diode, a spike suppression diode across it, even though it's not drawn in here, and it concerns me it's not drawn in here, like Ford, you, I know they know they have to have one, because any engineer understands that when I shut this off, I'm going to get a big spike out of that coil. But a lot of times, wiring diagrams just aren't drawn correctly. And it's just not drawn with those diodes. Now what I was hoping is I could find wherever the diode was and Ford made it so we could go and just fix it. The last car I had like this, the diode, one of the legs, it, it, the last car, the diode was right across down here and the diode leg had broken. And then it had been hitting that, that spike had been hitting that computer over and over and once I fixed the spike suppression I had to replace that computer, that processor as well. So you can't let big spikes, 200, 300 volt spikes hit a computer. The, the, the silicone in the microprocessors just don't hold up to large spikes and it can damage them. So these have to be suppressed one way or another. You gotta suppress this guy here. Sometimes they'll do it in the relay. Normally it's a diode right across this, this winding out here.
So what I did is I just put a diode right in here and I wired it to ground. That's what you've seen us do in this video. But you got to have some kind of spike suppression on here. And in this drawing, they don't draw that anywhere. So basically, it's just not drawn in this drawing. But again, don't get confused that that's not drawn here. We know that the spike is shutting the car down because we've watched it over and over when that spike hits it resets or puts the throttle into a default position. So that spike cannot be here and I've done enough work with spikes like this that these are not good on computer systems and they create havoc. Normally the diode is across down here but it's not drawn so we're going to put one down here anyway to get rid of the spike because I know it can't have the spike. Any engineer that built this car knows these spikes and they put a, a suppression diode usually on the clutch. It's not drawn, but it, believe me guys, it has to be in here. Now I don't know where Ford put it and the wiring diagram doesn't help me at all, but I know where I'm going to put this one to fix this car. That's the most important thing. Just realize that you can't have two, three, four hundred volt spikes hitting a car. And we can see this thing has 180, 190 volts negative spike. And 180 or 90 volts negative spikes is shutting the computer down. And it can also damage it if it's left, if it just continues to run for a long period of time and it keeps spiking the computer. You can end up putting computers in for these type of spikes. So we're going to put the diode right across here is our fix. And that's going to fix this. This will fix the car because we'll have that diode and we'll get rid of the spike. But the spike has to be fixed, guys. And when you go look for it and it's not drawn, don't get confused because it has to ha be in there. It's just not drawn in these wiring diagrams. But there's, they usually have either a resistor or a diode, and a diode is more effective than a resistor. But whatever it is, Ford didn't draw it, or it's not drawn in this diagram. Ford might have it in some of their real wiring diagrams, but I don't see it in this, and this is just a, a makeover of a Ford wiring diagram. But I know it's going to have to be in there to fix the car, so we're going to get that resistor installed on this Ford Thunderbird so we can fix it. See if we default the throttle body or not. If this is going to fix it or not, I'm just not sure. And this car was pretty intermittent on the problem, so we're going to have to let it run a while. And I don't got a lot of time, so I'm going to probably have to leave and let this shop run this vehicle and see what happens. Um, I've already been here a bit now. But I've got the diode in the system. And again, I've got this diode. I've got this diode across this, this clutch right here. And we can see that we're in control still, but again, this is an intermittent problem. So maybe this is going to take care of it, I just don't know. I would have liked to have seen a diode drawn in the wiring diagram from Ford. But I know not to trust wiring diagrams, so we're just going to let it run with that diode in. It's super simple to put the diode in the way I've got it in there with just a little tiny kluge wire that's under the relay and then I got a diode going to ground from it and it's gotten rid of the spike. We've, we've suppressed that spike suppression with the diode. So now let's just see if we're going to default this or not. Hey guys, how's that? This little Ford Thunderbird is crazy, isn't it? Okay, so we've given this Thunderbird back his wings. The throttle is fully working. It's not defaulting. Ever since I've put the spike suppression diode, it's been running about a half an hour. It hasn't stalled. Everything seems good. The shop has still got to put that spike suppression diode permanently, and he'll do that down at the compressor clutch. He also still needs to fix the fuel control issue that we saw this car has, something where the fuel delivery has a problem. Looks like maybe a, a slightly plugged fuel filter or a pump issue. But the shop will take care of the, putting the diode in permanently and getting this and getting the fuel delivery problem fixed on this little T-Bird. 
This is a great car, isn't it? 